Thanks. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about recursive relations on the set of words with two letters, which, um, wait, how do I? Okay, here we go. So here are some notions of computability. We have the general recursive functions, uh, which is a class of functions from um, tuples of uh, the natural numbers to the natural numbers. And there's, a, there's some basic prim principles that generate the class of general recursive functions. Uh, and they've been proven to be equivalent to functions computable by a tree machine. And so today we're going to look at this class of relations called general discernible relations, uh, which were introduced defined by uh, we introduced by Grigorczyk in two thousand five, and they they're kind of similar. They're a class of relations this time, not functions, on the set of words with two letters generated from basic principles, which we'll get to later. So the actual principles themselves. Um, and uh, they're also equivalent to relations decidable by a tree machine, also we claim. And that's basically uh, what we're going to talk about today, how, why the general discernible relations are equivalent to relations decidable by a tree machine. So uh, a little background and motivation for why we care about this class of general discernible relations. Um, so. Uh, Gorchik speculates that results like Gödel's first incompleteness theorem doesn't fundamentally depend on arithmetic. So he introduced these general discernible relations, which we'll call GD relations for short, to prove an analogous result about a theory of concatenation uh, based on the one introduced by Tarski in the early 1930s. So we're not going to mention this theory in today's talk, um, but uh, my supervisor, Tomasz Kowalski, uh, did a, another talk in the logic seminar, which kind of went through that. Um, and Grigorczyk never really claimed that being GD was equivalent to being recursive, but uh, only that, like, uh, Grigorczyk used the notion of GD to uh, characterize recursiveness, but he didn't really kind of show it's equivalent to the Turing machine sense, or the strongest sense that we currently know. Um, okay, yeah, so this is kind of his motivation here. Uh, I take an element, uh, elementary theory of concatenation instead of arithmetic as the primary object theory of research. And as a meta theory, I take a theory of concatenation. And in, in such a meta theory, we define decidability uh, as yeah, general, uh, as computer, i.e. computability or general recursiveness. So the, this general recursiveness is the GD we're talking about. Uh, so we, we just define decidability as applied directly to the texts, uh, as in uh, the elements of, uh, or the text as in the words containing two letters. And we can prove the undecidability of TC without any recourse to numbers. So so yeah, that, that was basically his motivation to kind of, oops, to kind of prove a Gödel-like result, uh, but without recourse to numbers. So without uh, doing things like, like without, without involving arithmetic, like, um, like with Gödel numbering and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that's, that's kind of why we're interested in this general recursiveness. Um, okay, so, so just, uh, I'm going to introduce some notation. And so, so this TX is, we'll, we'll call the set of words of two letters, uh, TX. And so, okay, so recursive. So we call a relation recursive if it's also a recursive language on the alphabet A containing the three symbols A, B, and comma. So for example, uh, the set of ordered pairs um, such that both coordinates are equal is recursive because, because this uh, X comma X, because words of the form X comma X where X is a word on this alphabet. 
uh, is a recursive language on A. Okay, so, uh, and here we do. So here at this square uh, subset looking thing is denotes a substring. So this means S is a substring of T, this with a uh, under uh, subscript P is, means S is a prefix of T and subscript S means S is a suffix of T. I should have probably used a different symbol for the first string because of the S, but um, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, also, uh, ju just a cl clarification here. Uh, so if if an n tuple, uh, so if uh, uh, no, uh, so so if a a set R, if you take the complement of the set R with respect to the set of all n tuples of T n, if that uh, complement uh, is recursively enumerable. So if this blue set here is recursively enumerable, then that's uh, equivalent to the fact that uh, th this whole uh, complement with respect to R, but the complement with respect to the language is recursively enumerable. So in, in a, basically this blue uh, set is recursively enumerable if and only if this whole purple set is recursively enumerable. So to show that R is recursive, then it, it suffices to show that R and uh, this whole purple complement with respect to the whole, uh, whole set of words on, the, on A, it, it suffices to show that that whole thing is recursively enumerable in R itself. So we don't have to look at the complement with respect to uh, Tx to the n. So that's that. Um, okay, so general discernibility. So uh, yeah, here we define general discernibility. So a relation R on Tx is GD if and only if it can be constructed from the following base cases and applying some interactive conditions. So okay, so firstly, uh, these singletons uh, containing only A and only B, they're GD. And this uh, set here of, uh, of all uh, ordered pairs such that both coordinates are equal, this, this set here is a GD relation. And this, this set of all three tuples such that the first coordinate is the second coordinate concatenated with the third coordinate, that set there is a GD relation. So those are our base cases and here are the things we can do to them to get other GD relations. So we can add a parameter. So if R is a GD relation, then if you just add an arbitrary first coordinate, uh, then the resulting set is GD. Uh, you can eliminate duplicates. So if R is a GD relation, then then the then the set of all uh, m minus one tuples such that uh, this relation R holds for some repeated tuple. Well, uh, I guess in particular the first two repeated tuple is GD, but the repeated tuple can be anywhere because of this next condition, which means we can swap coordinates. So if we have a GD relation and we take another relation such that this relation R holds but for coordinates in different places, well really if for coordinates next to each other but by iter iterated application of this you can have it in any different places so we can swap coordinates basically. Um, okay, so and we can take the relative complement with respect to Tx to the n. So as far as GD, then uh, if you take the relative complements to Tx to the n, that's GD. And that, that would uh, preserve also being, being recursive because of that previous, uh, previous theme here. If the relative complement with respect to Tx to the n is 
GD, then uh, that preserves uh, computability. Um, okay, and we can also take the direct product, which so so yeah, it's just a set of all. So if you if you take the union of the uh, variables for for our new relation and and we take the set of all tuples such that R holds for the first n tuples and S holds for the uh, last k tuples. So that would give us a GD relation that will preserve being GD if R and S are GD. And okay, so we can also take a substring closed interior, which means if we have a GD relation R and we and we uh, take a relation such that uh, the first coordinate is closed, so, so closed under substrings, kind of. So, so if for all substrings of the first coordinate, oh, wait, sorry, that's supposed to be a square subset. Uh, sorry about that. That's supposed to be a substring. So, so yeah. So if we take all n tuples such that for all substrings of the first coordinate, uh, R holds uh, for that tuple with the first coordinate replaced by a substring, then that new relation there is GD. And we can take complementary projections, which means uh, if we have two, so if R can be defined uh, in such a way that there exists two GD relations such that R is equivalent to uh, to S with um, with uh, some co coordinates existentially quantified, and not R is equivalent to T with some coordinates ex existentially quantified, then R is GD. So basically, if there exists two GD relations such that their projection on some number of coordinates is is equivalent, then that projection is GD. Okay, so, so here's an example of how we how we might construct a GD relation, which is so we can kind of see that uh, so, so yeah, we'll just kind of go through. So, so this uh, singleton A, A, B is GD, but it actually takes a bit of doing to kind of show it straight directly from, from our um, inductive conditions and from our definition rather. Um, so, so, okay, so, so let's take this relation R and this relation S. So what is R? R uh, says that first coordinate is the second coordinate concatenated with the first coordinate, a third coordinate, and y is a and z is b. So r is r is basically just uh, a, b, a, b. And s is uh, all triples such that first corner is A or the first corner is B or the first corner is Y concatenated with Z the second yeah I should just use the I'll just use the letters from now so T is equal to Y concatenated with Z and both Y is not A and Z is not B so yeah okay so so yeah I, I define R this in this fancy way because uh, it'll be clearer why R would be GD. So yeah, there exists uh, Y and Z uh, in TX such that uh, that exists if and only if T equals AB. So, so it would, now we're just kind of saying why R is this, this set here, I think. Ah, no. So, okay. Right. So, so now we're kind of um, existential, 
de defining a new relation that's existentially quantified over R and S that can be existentially yeah, defined by existentially quantifying over a coordinate of R and a coordinate of S. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, so, so that, so we can use condition 10 because, uh, because A, because AB is the projection of R onto the first coordinate and also the, and not, uh, so the negate the relative complement of a b with respect to t x is the is equivalent to there exists y and z such that this relation holds so by ten if we can show that r and s are g d then this singles in this g d and Okay, so th this kind of go through, goes through Y, S, and R is GD. So yeah, so to show that S is GD, we kind of have to go through all these steps, which kind of went through, I went through a few steps at a time. So, okay, so right, C is the specified relation in condition two. So this is, this relation here is, uh, the relation that says, so condition three, which is the relation that describes um, concatenation. And here, these red relations are condition one, which describes, uh, which says the singletons contain, singleton containing A and the singleton containing B are GD. And, and we can also take negations and conjunctions based on, uh, if you have the slides in front of you, this might, you might already have it. So, so you can take, uh, so condition A says you can take conjunctions and condition seven means you can take negations basically, which is the same as relative complements in when, we, when we're talking about sets in this context. So yeah, so that that's, so then S1 is GD and S2, uh, we take more negations, we uh, involve more of these singletons, and we take more conjunctions and more negations. So all that is stuff we can do. And so S is, S we kind of just cancel out these duplicate coordinates and we shuffle them around, which we can do by five and six. So that's why S is GD. And we can kind of show that R is GD by a similar argument because R, you can see that R is constructed from this concatenation relation and this, these properties have been equivalent to, equal to A and B, which are our basic, base cases for being GD. Um, yep, and so yeah, so, so, so even construct showing that showing that this little set here is GD kind of takes a bit of doing if we're doing a straight. So so yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting that GD uh, would be equivalent to uh, being recursive because uh, and that'll be yeah uh, so. We claim that GD is exactly the set of relations that are also recursive sets. So we kind of give a sketch of why in for the rest of this talk. So okay, so so the one direction is uh, kind of is I guess more straightforward than the other. So so if we we can show that all GD sets are recursive by induction, so we can. Uh, we we can show that the base cases are well. We we know what being proof by induction is. I'm sorry. Uh, the so the proof of the converse is slightly more involved. So okay. So so the idea is so so we so this is kind of how we came up with the idea. So GD uh, the class GD can't 
We kind of suspected the class GD can't support sets of strings with lengths that grew uh, polynomially. And uh, Quine and Schweizer, uh showed that multiplication can be interpreted in uh, some in theories of concatenation. And uh, their interpretations uh, relied on a string that kind of witnesses the multiplication and seems to relate the multiplicands to it in a GD way. And so we got the idea that, so this witness that um, they used is a computation process. So we kind of thought we can kind of um, use a wit, uh, we can use a true machine computation process as a witness uh, in proving this somehow. Uh, so, okay, so here's the idea of the proof. So suppose that R is recursive, then there exists Turing machines M and N, M and N, such that M accepts N, uh, so M, decide, M uh, accepts R and N accepts the complement of R with respect to, well, actually N just, just uh, accepts the complement of R with respect to the whole alphabet, which is the same, uh, which would be sufficient because of uh, the thing I talked about before the diagrams. And okay, so if we show that the M plus one area relations, uh, the, so these two M plus one area relations are GD, then we can apply axiom 10 to these two relations to obtain a G relation. And that relation is R. So why is this the case? Because, so, okay, so SM is, so so we have X, which is an N tuple, and, and we have a, C, we have a, an accepting computation of X. So, so because, uh, in that case, our R will be, there exists CM such that SM holds for X, uh, blah, 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 CM, and there, and not, and not R holds if and only if there exists CN such that SN holds for, uh, for those coordinates with ACN at the end. So, Okay, so, so here's some uh, kind of lemmas we need. So, and, and some definitions. Uh, so we call a, we also have the notion of GD functions. So we call a function GD if and only if its graph is a GD relation. And we have this altered version of, uh, of axiom, well, condition, inductive condition nine of being GD. So, so we can take, so, so we uh, kind of enumerate over the substrings of Y, but we can also keep Y itself as a, as, as a coordinate in, so, so if we have a relation R and we have, and, and there, and the new relation is defined in, in this way, but um, with Y itself as a coordinate of the old relation R, that still preserves being GD. Uh, yeah, so, and we have, a, and uh, this lemma says, uh, a relation is GD if and only if its characteristic function is GD. And we define as characteristic function uh, by just basically uh, mapping it to uh, to mapping the set of n-tuples to two different values with one being mapped to if and only if the inputs satisfy R and the other being mapped to if the inputs uh, satisfy not R. And then R is GD if and only if the characteristic function is GD by this definition. And 
Okay, so we, we, we need the fact that substrings, prefix, and suffix relations are GD, uh, and that constant functions are GD, and, we can, and the fact that we can substitute functions into functions. So if we have two GD functions and we define a new function H by basically substituting one of these functions into the other, then the resulting function is also a GD function. So, so yeah. And, and this, so taking the longest substring is GD. So, uh, so we're going to take the longest substring of B. So, uh, so for example, so, uh, okay, so we define this function by uh, so, so this function basically says that that the longest substrings of B uh, in in W is equal to Z. So, for example, the so for example, LSB of BABB would be equal to BB because there's a BB in BABB, but there's no BBB. So that's the longest substring of bees, and and we and if 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 the long if the input doesn't have any bees in it, then we just define it as b. Uh, we we kind of need this uh, as a function. We we yes. anyway, this is a dd function, and we'll need it later. Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be lsb as well. It used to be A, but we changed it to B. And so, yeah, that's that. And we can also substitute functions into relations. So this is kind of similar to substituting functions into functions, except we have a relation and a function. Uh, and so if we define a new relation such that uh, such that we replace the first coordinate, uh, so we kind of substitute the function into one coordinate of the relation. If we define a new relation in this way, that new relation it would also be GD. And we, okay, so, so now we kind of define the notion of Define a way of encoding computations as elements of TX. Uh, so, given a Turing machine on the requisite alphabet, we can the requisite alphabet being uh, with a tape alphabet of A, B, comma, and blank space. Uh, so, given given such a Turing machine, we can define a function uh, which maps elements of the of tape alphabet union the states uh, by this table here. So the percent symbol denotes an infinite sequence of blank tape symbols. So I guess uh, gamma union, Q union, uh, the singleton containing the percent symbol in technicality, but yeah. So, the, so we have this encoding function and S, if S is a tree machine configuration, depicted as a string of elements uh, of this set, union, the percent symbol. Uh, then we denote by uh, phi of x, the string with phi applied to each of the elements. So, so, that, so basically you break them up as you do with encoding. So for instance, phi of percent a q naught phi would be that, which will be so, so yeah, basically we can break it up like that. So for example, 5% is a b5, b, uh, b concatenated with itself five times, concatenated with a, and so on. So, yeah. So we want to say that um, a, that cm is an accepting computation of x on the machine m if and only if uh, CM is of the form, so yeah, CM is a string on the alphabet AB, and 
that CF, so we want to say this is true if CF is of, CM is of the form phi of arrow C1, so so we want we want the C1, C2 up to CK to be a sequence of Turing machine configurations. And then we have the arrows in between just to kind of break them up and tell us where C1 begins and C1 ends and C2 begins and so forth. And we want C1 to be phi of percent Q0 X percent, which is basically uh, what you want on your tape at the start and with the state at Q0 and with the reader with the with the reader at um, the be, the beginning of the first letter of the input x, and we want uh, c k to be uh, percent q y percent, which uh, is just the accepting state with a blank tape, and it, so each uh, each configuration c i is obtained. By doing one step of computation on the machine M with configuration C I minus one, and so uh, condition three shows no, not condition three. Condition condition two condition two shows that we need the encoded version of X to construct C M because. Because we need this x here, and if we break up the phi, we'll have a phi of x here, so we need the phi of x. And so we want a relation E such that uh, the relation such that uh, two strings are related if only if the first string is the encoding of the second string. No, the sec if only if the second string is the encoding of the first string U. And to make the relation GD, we want another parameter that witnesses the encoding. We, we kind of need another parameter, in fact, that witnesses the encoding of U as V. So instead, uh, we actually want a, a ternary relation. Uh, and we want to say that E of U, V, and W, U, V, W, if and only if uh, V is the encoding of U and W uh, describes the steps taken to encode U. So for instance, uh, if you let U be ABB and V be ABA, ABBA, ABBA. So V is the encoding of U. And so we we'll also need to separate a sigma and a marker delta and so we want to say that E of U, V, and W, uh, if W is this string here. So we have sigma, uh, we have kind of these sigmas as separators, and we have these, these things here, which are various stages of encodedness, so to speak. So we have uh, delta ABB, which is, we start with ABB and we haven't encoded anything. So the marker delta kind of marks how much, where we are in our encoding. So everything in front of delta is encoded and everything uh, to the right of delta is not encoded. So the, the delta moves to the right and, and each step follows by encoding one letter of the string to the right of delta. And we end up with the delta at the right and the fully encoded string on the left. And so in general, yeah, so in general, uh, W is uh, a, str a string of w WIs separated by sigmas. And each WI is something delta something with yeah, with, with the, something in front of the delta being encoded stuff and something uh, to the right being unencoded stuff. And WI is a, so each each of these things, each of these WI is, a sep is obtained by applying one of these following transformations. So 
So these are the encoding transformations, basically. So this just means you uh, encode an A into ABA, and this means you encode AB into ABBA. And if we if we take so if we take uh, delta to be this string here, which is and and sigma to be this string here, they will always work as separators because um, because they won't kind of interfere with these wi's, and we always know where where the sigmas and deltas begin and end. So if we take the longest substring of b's of u, and then follow it up with two b's and three b's, and because that's because the longest substring of b's in you'll ever get in w, we will ever get an encoding is two b. So if we have two b's and at least one extra b, then that would be basically okay because none of these wi's will have more uh, all of these wi's will have less b's than delta and that's why these would work as separators basically and so all we're doing is concatenating gd functions so 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 this this is kind of a sketch of why e is gd so we're all we're doing is concatenating GD functions uh, because we have uh, this GD function can act concatenate with some uh, basically identity functions. Um, and we're taking constants and we're taking, right, yeah, so yeah, we can, we're, we're concatenating constants rather not not because b bb is a constant and bbb is a constant uh, and we're and that's also a gd function and we're substituting the above into gd relations so we're substituting these into gd relations and we're taking conjunctions. So, so, so if we if we write this formally as a relation, we can say that so that's satisfied and that and that and that. So that's a conjunction. So, so if we so if each of these properties uh, preserve like are built from GD uh, like built up to be GD relations, so to speak, then we're just taking the conjunction of these. And we're also just taking substrings, prefixes, and suffixes. And where do we do that? Taking right. So so yeah, if we write this formally, we'll kind of need to say that uh, W. All right. There's 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 also another probably the that. W one is equal to delta u, and uh, w the w k is equal to v delta. So that's where the substrings come in. We need we need to say kind of delta uh, sorry sigma delta u sigma is a prefix of w and that kind of stuff. That's where we take that's where we take substrings, prefixes, and suffixes, and we quantify over substrings of W. So where do we do that? We, we can, uh, so yeah, so, so kind of uh, quantifying over substrings of W. So, Uh, yeah, so so we kind of say uh, if we write this formally, we'll, we'll eventually say uh, for all uh, w i basically. So for all for all words that satisfy the property of being a w i, um, certain other properties hold. So for example, w i is obtained 
from WI minus one by a, so so the so the, to say that the WIs have this uh, relation to each other, we kind of we need to quantify over substrings of W. Okay, so so that that's basically all we're doing to construct E, and and also if we uh, the energy version of E, so to speak, would also be GD. So so if the so if the coordinates, uh, so if, if we have n, um, so okay. So if we ha if we have n strings and and we have another n strings, which are the encodings of the first n strings, and we have the n witnesses, and we have a v, which is the concatenation of all of all the encodings, then, then if, then that, then all the set of all tuples related in that way is GD because we take conjunctions. So, so yeah, because E is GD and we're taking conjunctions and where we have this, GD function with constants and concatenations. Uh, so, be, because uh, we can, that that's all the things that are involved here. This NRE E is GD, and yeah. So, so A B two three A is just the encoding of the comma. Okay, so, if we already have. Okay, sorry, I'm. I guess I'm running a bit short on time. Um, if we already have an encoding, then its relation to its exception computation is analogous to the relation between U and W. So the right, so the so the thing being encoded and the the witness. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so we kind of want to construct the computation relation in a similar way to the encoding relation. So, so CM is kind of like a witness for the uh, acceptance of, acceptance of V. <laughs> Sorry. And and yeah, so 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 but, but we can only construct such a thing for an encoded for for a string that is an encoding of something. Uh, and so so yeah, so so this relation between an encoded string and its accepting computation is kind of similar to to the relation between a string and its witness for its encoding. So we have this sequence of, so we want the computation to be this sequence of train machine configurations. And we have the this separator and this marker, which tells us, uh, this marker, which tells us where the train machine head is, the where the reader is, which tape symbol's been read, I guess, and and yeah, uh, each of these Turing machine configurations can be obtained by doing one step of computation from the previous configuration. So as an example, uh, so so right, so this is just kind of for uh, slightly more formally how how this would work. We we can like formally define which transitions need to be applied. And and yet we we say that we define this relation CM uh, by the two coordinates having that relationship, and CM is GD to similar reasons to how E is GD. And so putting it all together, so uh, if we have a Turing machine M on the requisite alphabet, uh, this relation 
which says that uh, this this v is the encoding of uh, these n strings, and and this cm is an accepting computation of this v. So so this relation here that says that is GD. So yeah, now we can show that all recursive sets are GD. So yeah, so if we suppose that R is recursive, then there exists uh, Turing machines M and N such that there exists all this stuff uh, that so 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 okay so if x is r if x is in r then x gets accepted so there exists uh, a machine m such that such that sm so such that there exists an encoding of the n tuple x and the witnesses and the and the Concatenation of the, the encodings of the individual uh, coordinates of the tuple, and an accepting computation of that encoding. So, so that that's what SM says the, that uh, X is accepted by CM basically if there exists all this stuff in between such that this relation holds. So, uh, so I guess, yeah, in, in short, uh, this thing here says um, X is in R if and only if X is accepted by the machine M. And this thing here says um, X is not in R if and only if X is accepted by the machine N. And yeah, acceptance by machine M and machine N is can be characterized as existentially uh, as as there exists uh, blah 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 such that a GD relation holds. So that's why R is GD by uh, rule ten of the definition for GD. And yes, that's it. Um, thanks for listening.